kind of very conventional, very obvious topic in a new kind of way, rather than sort of seeing the ways in which theology is just more grist for the modernist mill, seeing what other kind of combinations uh, can be uh, detected in the work of artists like Charles Behe, uh, David Jones, and also sort of like post-war French thought. And we have three wonderful speakers who will be our guides. I think I'm going to introduce you guys and then let you uh, come up, if I may, just to uh, move things right along. Uh, so our first speaker in this panel is Anne Carpenter, an associate professor of theology at St. Mary's College in California. She's written essays on the Trinity, Blondel, Peggy, Thomistic metaphysics, and Benedictine monasticism. Her book, Theopoetics, Hanser's on Balthazar, and the Risk of Art and Being, discusses the, uh, Balthazar's use of poetic and metaphysical modes of argumentation together, and its implications for theology. Her recent work has focused on theolo theologies of tradition, especially on key figures who influenced the resource model of the early 20th century, and on the interaction or collision between theological aesthetics and decolonial thought. Uh, Tony Domestico is an associate professor of literature at Purchase SUNY, uh, and he is a book columnist for Commonweal, frequent reviewer for the Boston Globe. Uh, his book, Poetry and Theology in the Modernist Period, uh, is just out from Johns Hopkins. And Stephen Lewis is professor of English at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He teaches in a variety of periods and figures in the British and American uh, literary traditions and writes about modern and contemporary American British and French literature and modern philosophy and Christianity. He has translated books by Jean-Luc Chrétien, Jean-Luc Marion, and Claude Romano, and he is currently writing about post-World War II French thought centered around the journal Dieu du Monde. Please join me in welcoming Anne. So I'm mostly anglicized Peggy's French. I will occasionally slip into a Midwesterner's version of French, <laughs> which uh, means it's a, something like a technical term for Peggy. I would like to spend my brief time speaking by articulating three aporias about the modern world in Charles Peggy's thought. Each of them has to do with what the modern world is and means. Each of them is very much more than the modern world. And each of them is a kind of mystery by way of truth. The first and most important aporia is that the Catholic Church has brought the modern world into existence. Quote, they do not want to say their mea culpa, says Cleo, the muse of history in Peggy's essay of the same name. They who have had so many said professionally. Peggy's they here is the people he refers to as clerks or curates. In a day that slides between the authorities of the Sorbonne and the authorities of the Catholic Church, a they that is both secular and ecclesial. Their errors are different. The professors of the Sorbonne deny the eternal, the clergy deny the temporal, and each error is no less grave. But if history had to say which of these errors is worse, she would name that of the Catholic Church. At least the secular curés, after all, quote, at least they do not invoke the religion that they are destroying. For Peggy, the Catholic Church is responsible for the Christianization of the world. But what we have in the modern world is the de-Christianization of the world. We have the exact opposite of the Christian mystique. We have a flight from the world, an unhallowing of formerly Christian ground. The curés, my friend, have lost the people who have received the promise, says Peggy. In the voice of Cleo, he mocks those priests who would blame the losses of Christianity on the evils of the age. This, to Peggy, is simply a refusal to countenance the real problem and its burdens. 
sin and evil, we must remember, are not a problem for God. Indeed, Christianity is built for sinners and saints, for ages filled with sinners and saints. Besides, says history, all ages belong to God. All clerks, unfortunately, do not. We must ask Peggy what it is that the curates do not wish to see. His answer, his answer is as forthright as it is elusive. On the one hand, what Christians do not wish to see is simply that the world is perfectly not Christian, that it has figured out a way not to be so, and that, really, the world exists, goes on existing, knows how to exist without being Christian. Everything is modern, says Cleo. That is what one must see, what must be said. Everything is completely unchristian. Alas, alas, if it were merely bad Christianity, one could see a way out, one could begin to talk. My child, we have seen a world, a society, I do not say a city, a perfectly viable and entirely unchristian society. On the other hand, the cures have committed a kind of violence to Christianity, one that has in some way produced modernity. Their violence is to undo Christianity's delicate balance, its fundamental operation. For Peggy, that operation is always toward the world and always centered upon salvation in Christ. Christianity itself is thus a temporally founded city of eternity. It is the flowering forth of eternity in time. And finally, and here is the operation toward, Christianity is the nourishment of time under the light of eternity. Christianity is a mystical city working for the world, a city for the salvation, not the domination of the world. And so the cures, in their denial of eternity or of history, but especially of history, cut the artery of connection, sunder the toward and between of temporality and eternity, of life and grace. They destroy the potency for the Christian operation and the very operation itself, so that, quote, there is nothing left, no world to save no Christianity left. The second aporia has to do with Cleo herself, with history. She is a secular woman with roots deep in eternity, but she is not a Bergsonian. This is our mystery, or the point of it, that she's not a Bergsonian. In his very last essay called Descartes and the Cartesian Philosophy, Peggy associates history, memory, and money with the ready-made, too thick. This is by no means a compliment. To be ready-made is to be measurable and negotiable, to be recorded and recordable. It is to be rendered always ready for autonomized use. Bergson and Bergsonianism are concerned with Reality, with the delay of the now, with the presence of the present, and thus also the unmeasurable and unmade. The present, this kind of present, is supple, and so it demands supple reason, and, quote, a supple morality, a heart perpetually held to account, end quote. It is Peggy's Bergson who sees if we might borrow from monastic terminology, that reality requires a perpetual vigil. He sees that the office of hours is always about the hour at hand, the hour opened to eternity. He sees that the only real available to us is the present, the inexhaustible well of the presence of the present. Modernity occurs on the side of the ready-made and consists fundamentally in the making past, the making into history, memory, of the present. 
Thus, saving money in one's bank account falls under Peggy's ire. As Matthew McGuire explains, Peggy, quote, finds within the reign of money the constant incentive to adopt certain ethical, psychological, and metaphysical positions in living and thinking, end quote. The reign of money affects a decreation that lays hold of the world by defleshing it of genuine possibility. This makes the modern world, in Peggy's words, essentially parasitical. Parasitical on reality itself, we conquer it by its own fecundity. Which brings us again to the Bergsonian Revolution, which is a revolution against the modern world, precisely because it shatters the ready-made to make way for the present hour. The revolution for Peggy is the French Revolution. But in fact, human tradition, and so in a sense human history, is animated by revolution, by many revolutions. Revolutions, in order to be effective, must continually take place and must continually be purified in their taking place as they bring about a purer, more traditional, more ancient, more human humanity. Colloquial speech about revolutions presumes their break with tradition, but he does not deny this feature. For him, however, revolutions are also a kind of intervention of the ancient into the present. And in this, revolutions are as well a kind of intervention of humanity into its own present. In other words, revolutions and traditions are not opposed, even when they are opposed. For what revolutions oppose in traditions is the ready-made. They oppose the conservation of the unseen and unreflected upon, the conservatism unto the suffocation of the human beings, the death of the lives of the human beings who are in their traditions. Revolutions and traditions are, in other words, against the automatic, against the measured, against the modern historicizing of the human present. Our third aphoria brings together our first two. Were I to say it in a sentence, I would say it is Peggy's notion that the Catholic follows the world. But this is not really to say what he means. At the very end of his very last essay, Peggy discusses pilgrimage, pilgrimages and signposts. These, these appear, at first, not at all related to his various reflections on the modern world, on Cartesianism, on Bergson. Just before this strange moment, Peggy has criticized scholasticism, especially neo-scholasticism, as a thoroughly modern enterprise. Quote, their scholasticism is a Christian theology immobilized in the structures of an Aristotelian reticulation, and consequently, it is modern. His, his point is that this type of theology not only denies the temporal, but also, and in particular, it denies the present moment. Nothing is gained forever, Peggy said. This is the human condition itself and the most profound condition of the Christian. In other words, the present that is always arriving and passing away, the real always surging forth and ebbing into memory, the temporal in the face of the eternal, this is the Christian real, the Christian precarity, that money denies and that the theologians refuse. Their denials and their refusals end the world, the aliveness of the world. And so their denials and their refusals also end the Christian world. Peggy's Christianity is a religion meant for the real world. We have a sense now what this means. Christian life, alive with the life of eternity, nourishes temporality. This is fundamentally an engagement with reality, 
the only reality, which is only always narrow. It is an enabling of human freedom, activated by and active only in the present moment. So too Christianity enables a world of human freedoms tilted upward together in radical hope, the hope that is only alive for the day, each day, until eternity. But this reality in this world that Christianity is involved in is not made by Christianity, it cannot be ready-made. It is the world and the real as given, perpetually welling forth in time according to the eternal will of God. The cross set along the pilgrimage road is not a signpost. It doesn't know that it has been stood up by this or that road. It is there on some part of the earth. It seems to know that it is always the same earth. The Catholic therefore approaches the cross, the world, with joy. Quote, a pointless joy, gratuitous, superfluous. The Catholic bears joy over the givenness of the real. In this joy, the Catholic approaches the cross that is meant for the world and approaches the world that is meant for the cross. The Catholic thus is always in the midst of a precarious, supple, living journey, a revolutionary journey, a journey to a cross not made by hands, a world not made by Catholics, a worlded cross given and not made, always and now. For the Catholic follows the world. Thank you. Um, so I did have some slides. Unfortunately, the AV is not working. So you'll have to. Uh, forgive me for looking at my phone to read some of the quotes that were supposed to be on the screen. Um, within the last uh, 10 or so years, there's been renewed interest in Anglophone modernism's relationship with gen uh, religion generally and the Catholic imagination specifically. And what's surprising to me isn't that such a recovery has happened, it's that such a recovery was needed in the first place. After all, you can't shake a stick at a modernist text without tropes and figures and ideas from the Catholic tradition falling out. In To the Lighthouse, Mrs. Ramsey's dinner party is described in Eucharistic fashion as the breaking of bread, or at least the serving of bouffe en banc, en dal, is, uh, partakes of eternity. Rebecca West wrote a book-length biography of St. Augustine. Juna Barnes' great novel, Nightwood, features decadent disquisitions on sacramentality and baptism and Ignatius of Loyola. And this deep imbrication of modernism and Catholicism wasn't just present in individual works of modernism. It was also present in what we might call the institutions of Anglophone modernism. It's a scholarly truism that modernism grew up in little magazines. Small, avant-garde literary periodicals like The Little Review and The Egoist served as incubators for modernist experimentation, the forge out of which imagism and Ulysses in the Wasteland emerged. And perhaps the most important, and certainly the most august, of these magazines was The Criterion, which T.S. Eliot edited from its first issue in 1922 to its final issue in 1939. Uh, here is the cover of the first issue uh, from 1922. <clears throat> but um, just to tell you what's in the first issue, uh, to tell you what's in bold letters on the cover of the first issue, uh, first we notice in bold letters The Wasteland, uh, which was published in fact for the first time in that inaugural issue of The Criterion. <coughs> There's also one of the first contemporaneous engagements with James Joyce's Ulysses, in a review essay written by the French poet Valérie Larbeau. And then finally, there's a really interesting uh, ghost story written by the modernist uh, novelist and critic May Sinclair called Victim, uh, 
and I'll return to Sinclair a little bit later. <coughs> um, but so as the table of contents reveals for this first issue of the Criterion, uh, that magazine was present at the very beginnings of modernism. And indeed, it helped shape what we take to be modernism. Publishing Proust for the surf, first time in English, reviews by and of Auden, staging debates about aesthetics between T.S. Eliot and J. Middleton Murray. And if modernism grew up in the pages of the Criterion, and I'd argue it did, then it's worth noting how frequently something else appeared in its pages, namely theological debates and disputes and discussions. Indeed, for long stretches in the late 20s and early 30s, the Criterion was as much a theological review as it was a literary magazine. Eliot published essays by Etienne Gilson and the Jesuit theologian Martin Darcy. He commissioned reviews by Anglo-Catholics of new books by Karl Barth and Reinhold Niebuhr. He staged multi-issue debates about the nature of neo-Thomism. And these theological pieces sat side by side with the Wasteland and with Proust and with Conrad. Indeed, the one informed and often referred to the other. So in that debate about neo-Thomism, for instance, which took up an incredible amount of space in the magazine and went across several issues, uh, J. Milton Murray and T.S. Eliot and Martin Darcy and others were arguing not just about the inheritance of Aquinas, but through their arguments about Aquinas, about fundamental aesthetic issues. The differences between Romanticism and Classicism, for instance, and the relationship between poetry and ontology. And uh, to bring this even further into relief, we might look at a 1927 essay published in two parts. Um, so you can't see it, obviously, but it's an essay by um, Jacques Maritain called Poetry and Religion. Um, and it's a really lovely meditation on the relationship between the imagination and the metaphysical that uses Picasso, Rimbaud, and, uh, and others to, in order to define poetry as, quote, the divination of the spiritual in the sensible expressed itself in the sensible. And really interestingly, uh, it's, a, again, a really lovely essay in, on the, the uh, Underneath the title, we're told that it's translated by F.S. Flint, an imagist poet. Um, really interestingly, scholars have since argued that it was Eliot's own translation, um, and that it was just published under the name of F.S. Flint. But regardless of who actually uh, translated this, whether it was Flint or Eliot, poetry in religion is a striking document, a historically remar remarkable moment where we can see modernist aesthetics being articulated from a distinctively Catholic perspective. Um, in the time remaining here, I thought I'd look at a few moments in which this relationship between the modernist imagination and the Catholic imagination is made most explicit. More specifically, moments in which modernist artists uh, think about what happens in their own art by thinking about what happens in the sacraments. So I'll start with a famous passage uh, a moment that comes late in uh, Joyce's Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. And again, you'll have to forgive me for reading from my phone. Um, at this moment, Stephen Dedalus, who once thought he'd become a priest, has decided instead to become a poet. And he finds inspiration for his artistry in the painfulness of spurned love. His anger against her found vent in coarse railing at her paramour whose name and voice and features offended his baffled pride. A priested peasant with a brother a policeman in Dublin and a brother a potboy in Roy Cullen. To him, she would unveil her soul's shy nakedness to one who was but schooled in the discharging of a formal rite, rather than to him, a priest of the eternal imagination, transmuting the daily bread of experience into the radiant body of ever-living life. The radiant image of the Eucharist united again in an instant his bitter and despairing thoughts, their cries arising unbroken in a hymn of thanksgiving. And then we get one of Stephen's great purplish Eucharistic poems. Uh, Our broken cries and mournful lays rise in one Eucharistic hymn. Are you not weary of ardent ways? 
while sacrificing hands upraised the chalice flowing to the brim, tell no more of enchanted days. So here, Stephen differentiates between what he calls the merely formal rite of the actual priest and the more efficacious transubstantiation of the artist. And we can, and many critics have, read this as a moment in which Stephen abjures the Catholic faith for an artistic faith, in which his Catholic religion is rerouted into a new religion of art. But we might notice that even in this moment, Stephen, of course, describes the artist's powers in precisely Catholic sacramental terms. Indeed, he said, suggests that the more powerful an artist is, the more he resembles the true Catholic priest. By Stephen's logic, the formal rite of confession doesn't have sacramental efficacy. It's the artist whose act is sacramental. The priested peasant is, for Stephen, well, kind of Protestant. His acts are symbolic, formal, ultimately empty. And the agnostic artist Stephen is, well, deeply Catholic, transmuting the daily bread into eternal life. Now, another modernist, uh, the previously mentioned May Sinclair, also uses the difference between Protestant and Catholic understandings of the Eucharist in order to understand what makes the modernist artist modernist. So here she is in The Egoist, one of those uh, small magazines that I mentioned before, writing about imagism, the uh, avant-garde poetic movement associated most, most frequently with Ezra Pound, uh, Amy Lowell, and others. Um, and the images stress the essentially concrete nature of poetry, the ability of the precise, compressed image to hold within its very concreteness the numinous. And so this is from The Egoist by May Sinclair. For all poets, old and new, the poetic act is a sacramental act with its rubric and ritual. The Victorian poets are Protestant. For them, the bread and wine are symbols of reality, the body and blood. They are given in remembrance. The sacrament is incomplete. The images are Catholic. They believe in transubstantiation. For them, the bread and wine are the body and blood. They are given. The thing is done. So for Sinclair, there's a deep analogy between the immediacy of the Imagist poem and the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. The Imagist poem doesn't refer to or describe that which it seeks to capture. Through its, partic through its particular concrete details, the Imagist poem embodies, incarnates, makes present that which it seeks. And to get at what Sinclair is arguing here, we might think about uh, an example of a great Imagist poem, probably the most famous Imagist poem, uh, Ezra Pound's In a Station of the Metro, which in its entirety reads, the apparition of these faces in the crowd pedals on a wet black bow. According to Sinclair, this poem is Catholic because it doesn't assert a similarity between its two objects, those faces and those petals. Rather, by linking the two just with a semicolon, Pound asserts that the two are somehow one. Urban image and pastoral image, human faces and flower petals, bread and body, wine and blood are united. Now, Sinclair wasn't herself a believer. The Anglo-Welsh poet uh, David Jones was, and he had similar things to say about modernist representation and sacramentality. And in his letters, but especially in his 1955 essay, Art and Sacrament, Jones, like Sinclair, links modernist representation to Catholic notions of transubstantiation. In modernist artworks, Jones argues, mimesis, in which an artwork imitates something outside of itself, is undone in, in favor of something different. For the modernist, the question isn't, is the world out there transcribed accurately into the work of art? As Jones puts it, the good painter must say, this is not a representation of a mountain. It is mountain under the form of paint. In other words, the work of art doesn't refer to its subject, it represents it, and that's the spelling that Jones almost always uses, makes it present and actual again 
through the artwork's formal relations. Then Jones links this modernist understanding of representation to the Catholic idea of transubstantiation. Just as for Picasso, a painting doesn't refer to a tree, but is the tree under the form of painting, so for the Catholic, the Eucharist doesn't refer to Christ, but is Christ under the form of bread and wine. In both form and substance, the symbol and its meaning are one. In a 1967 letter, Jones elaborates on this link, asserting that, quote, nothing could be more post-impressionist than what the church predicated of the mass, where sign and thing signified are said to be one. So for both Jones and Sinclair, the believer and the unbeliever, modernism is modernism, in part through its distinctively Catholic aesthetic sensibility, privileging representing over representing the actual over the merely symbolic, seeing the material and concrete as the route to the mysterious and transcendent. And because our conference is thinking about what the Catholic imagination has meant and continues to mean today, I thought I'd end with the words of a contemporary poet, Danny Howe, who is actually here with us for the next few days. For the book is the first poem from her 2014 collection, Second Childhood. And in its compression and lucidity, this short poem echoes imagism at its best. I think it's a deeply modernist poem. In its, and in its invocation of the Eucharist, a God we can swallow, it reminds us of modernism's sacramental imagination. So I'll just end with Howe's words for the book. Yellow goblins and a God I can swallow. Eyes in the evergreens under ice interior monologue and some voice. Weary fears, the usual trials, and a place to surmise blessedness. Thank you. joys of going last is you get to see all of the connections <laughs> that are um, that are that are coming I think so uh, all right I, the the title I have for this is uh, modern French poetry and the communion of human language in the real so I've been working for some time now on a project focused on 20th century and contemporary French literary engagements with the Bible and um, in doing that work, I found two recent French Catholic thinkers to be particularly useful in helping me to grasp uh, better two different things. The first thing is how to understand the poetics of a modern Catholic poet like Paul Claudel, who lived from 1868 to 1955. How to understand uh, his poetics in relation to some of the major figures of modern French poetry. Um, so Baudelaire, 1821 to 1867, uh, Arthur Rimbaud from 1850. 54 to 1891, and Stéphane Mallarmé, 1842, 1898. So um, in the French context, the, the modernist poets are a little earlier in many ways, uh, and then they have a big impact on um, a number of the English poets, and then you have a kind of a cubist phase of, of uh, modernism in, in French literature uh, in the 20th century, and then it's surrealism and Dada and surrealism. So anyway, that's the first thing. Uh, the, the straightforwardly uh, Catholic poetics that Paul Claudel is working in, how that relates to these figures of, of, of what we maybe call French modernism. And then the second is how to understand Claudel's project as well as that of his immediate modern predecessors, these Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Mallarmé, in relation to what we might call the poetics of human speech understood in the light of faith in the incarnate word. So the two thinkers I have in mind are the Dominican priest Olivier Thomas Benau, who writes and thinks about literature in the Bible in constant reference to the metaphysics and theology of St. Thomas Aquinas, and Jean-Louis Chrétien, whose work approaches various aspects of the relationship between the biblical and the literary within the framework of a phenomenology of speech. 
While phenomenological and Thomistic approaches to a subject like literature in the Bible are bound to be importantly different, one thing that Venaud and Chrétien have in common is that they each think and write in the wake of and with full knowledge of 20th century poetics, linguistic theory, and deconstructive practices, which, at least in the French context, are importantly inspired especially by the poetics of Rimbaud and Mallarmé. Furthermore, from their respective positions in the wake of these linguistic theories and practices, they each privilege speech in the multiplicity of acts that constitute it as central to understanding human existence. Each of these thinkers possesses deep literary sensibilities. Venau was pursuing a doctorate in modern and contemporary French poetry as a student at the École Normale Supérieure, so it's like a, a very fancy um, elite uh, graduate school, before deciding to pursue his vocation to the priesthood. While Chrétien, who passed away this summer at the age of 67, published six volumes of poetry himself between eight, uh, 1989 and 2001, in addition to almost 30 philosophical books published throughout his career. What I propose to share with you then are some of what I think are the most interesting ideas expressed by these thinkers about the ways in which modern and contemporary French writers grapple variously with the relationship between the human word and the divine word or logos. Um, so Venard's primary uh, book is entitled, um, in, in English tra translated, it would be Thomas Aquinas Poet, uh, Poet theologian, and it uh, it's about two thousand uh, pages in length, um, published in three volumes from two thousand two to two thousand nine, and um, fortunately for us English readers, there is a translation of about a third of it that just came out in two thousand nineteen called the Poetic Christ. So if you're interested in some of the things I say about him, I would, I would definitely check it out. Um, so the, the titles of the different volumes maybe give you an idea of what he's doing. So the first volume is entitled Literature and Theology, A Season in Hell. Now, A Season in Hell is uh, Rimbaud's famous uh, kind of epic poem, you could say. Um, and, it, and, and this book contains a couple chapters that do a pretty thorough reading of that poem, um, as well as, as other, other stuff. Uh, the second volume is called um, The Language of the Ineffable, Essay on the Theological Basis of Metaphysics. So that's really focused on Thomas's metaphysics. And uh, volume three is called Pagina Sacra, The Passage from um, Holy Scripture or Holy Writing to Theological Writing. Um, so those are published 2002, 2004, and 2009. Um, through a thoroughgoing focus on the poetic features in Aquinas' writing in metaphysics, theology, and biblical commentary. So he's really interested in the poetics of Aquinas, which, which is interesting because part of the poetics of Aquinas is to uh, be as direct and, in, in a sense, non-literary as possible, but that's still literary. That's the way of talking about it. Um, so through, through a thoroughgoing focus on the poetic features in Aquinas' writing of metaphysics, theology, and biblical commentary, Venard argues that all aspects of Aquinas' thought are explicitly based on a linguistically mediated encounter with the incarnate word of God, Jesus Christ, and that a proper understanding of all the ramifications of this basis, of this linguistic basis, shows that it diffuses virtually all efforts to deconstruct Christianity. So that's kind of one of his biggest arguments. As part of his efforts to make the case that attending to the role of language in Thomas is so important, Venard devotes several chapters to modern and contemporary French poetry with a special focus on Rimbaud and Stéphane Mallarmé. Um, and basically, Venard thinks that virtually all French poets since the 20th century are writing in reference to either the project of Rimbaud or that of Claudel. And this might sound really black and white, but he does a really good job of, of showing how this this, this um, frame works and yet still accounts for you know, all of the artistic um, variety. So I think it's, it's an interesting idea. Through his analysis of the work of these poets, Bernard diagnoses the common attitudes toward language and meaning of our age, while at the same time making the case that these poets, despite their explicit critiques or rejection of Christianity, continue to pursue ultimately theological questions. So here's a long quotation that I was going to have on the screen for you to take in, I'll, I'll just read it. 
At least since Rimbaud, it is accepted that I is another. That's a famous quote from Rimbaud. Je est un autre. Where neither I nor you are identifiable, how could him, the other, be? With the word lost and Holy Scripture invalidated, it is often thought that wisdom can be found in the quest for meaning. From now on, however, the poets must be content with merely a meaning of sorts. But can poetry avoid the absolute? The question of meaning comes first. The poets are the inheritors, volentes nolentes, of the Judeo-Christian tradition, and they seem condemned to rival mythically or mystically the incarnate word, Christ himself. Many poetic works or contemporary critics style themselves as attempting to define in their spoken or written material some deep magnetization of language that people of letters continue to feel despite the erosion of the Judeo-Christian context of contemporary society. Throughout the centuries, the theology of the word has provided the vocabulary which enables one to take into account the mysterious creative power of language. Forgetting this theology of the word imposes on the arts of language the need to imagine anew the whole matrix of meaning, genotext and phenotext, archi-écriture and écriture, a symphony of undetermined idioms, accepting questions without responses, multiple ways of speaking of lived difference with the knowledge of the discursive character of all human thought between language, thought, and the real. After the proclamation of the death of God and the erasure of religion in any genuine form, idols are forged in the new mythologies, which become the great ideologies of the past century question of meaning is ignored, yet this question is as vital to discourse as light is to vision, and thus literature has become the place where moderns seek to revive the original and Adamic experience of naming. Consciously or not, the intentions of the modern poet are theological. That's the end of the long quote. This long passage gives you a taste of how Van Ar argues for the persistent impact of Christianity's particular way of conceiving of meaning through the theology of an incarnate word on all who write in its van. So everyone is, is impacted by this, this past, even, even when they're rejecting it. Doesn't mean they can't reject it, but they're still impacted by it. This persistent impact doesn't have to be taken as an imposition or an impediment to freedom. For Venard, it is a hopeful sign that human beings have such great difficulty in attempting to reduce language to mere utilitarian communication and thereby avoid meaning. As long as this difficulty persists, humanity remains. He writes, in experiencing the ontological simultaneity of the poetic experience and of its object, even if that object is the void, major contemporary writers remind our era that a theology, even a negative one, is always possible. Unquote. The poetry of Paul Claudel and of subsequent poets who hold to a similar theology of language, such as the living poet Jean-Pierre Le Maire, who was born in 1948, he's just one, there, there are a couple others, is held up by Venard as a contrast to Rimbaud. And again, lest we jump to, this, to suspect that this claudel rimbaud opposition is something simplistic, black and white, so I, I mean, Rimbaud is, uh, Venard is completely aware that Rimbaud played a, a key role in Claudel's conversion. And I had a slide with some of the things he says about the effect of reading Rimbaud, but it was very important. Um, so uh, let's, let's turn now to Jean-Louis Chrétien's phenomenology of speech in order to get a good grasp of the essence of Claudel's understanding of the poet's word in relation to human existence, creation, and God. So Chrétien, the second uh, philosopher who just died this summer, develops his phenomenology of speech through many books. My favorite and one of the books most congenial to a study of literature in the Bible is the 1998 volume uh, L'Arche de la Parole, The Arc of Speech, which also exists in English, uh, published in 2003 by Routledge, so it's called The Arc of Speech. The book is focused on the ways in which human speech serves as an instrument of our hospitality, and the title refers to a patristic interpretation of Adam's naming of the animals in Genesis 2, verses 19 through 20, according to which Adam's speech is the first and last ark in which humanity gathers and safeguards its fellow creatures, the animals. There are chapters on the phenomenon of speech in relation to listening, prayer, silence, beauty, and the capacity of human beings to make an offering of the world through praise and thanksgiving. Claudel and a polyphony of other voices exemplify throughout the text the speech acts Chrétien describes and discusses. To allow me a quick sketch of Chrétien's phenomenology of speech, 
in Clétien's work, uh, as the philosopher Camille Riquier puts it, quote, man is not an animal endowed with language. Not an animal endowed with language. Speech, or logos, is indeed the place where meaning arises and where our humanity reveals itself. But for this very reason, it does not belong to us, and we cannot make of it a point of pride. What is more, we will never master it, because we are not its source. It is we who are in it, not it in us. Chrétien meditates on existence as he meditates on speech, indissociably, holding that the one is the perfect mirror in which the other can reflect itself in its multiple dimensions. So existence itself is reflected in the many ways in which speech acts are uh, unfold. Speech becomes itself and is described only in diffracting itself through our finite acts of speech, in which each time speech becomes an event for us. So all human speech, then, is a response. It is never, never inaugural, but always elicited by things in reality. So it's always a response. Uh, quote, thus we speak without being able to do it by ourselves, only speaking up because the words were given, aroused by a voice that calls us from the outside and which necessarily wounds us. Nevertheless, speech does not die from its wounds. Rather, it draws life from them. Speaking rests on our weaknesses, not on our strengths. And the wound that other people, things, or even God inflicts on us through the call they put forth is the fissure through which we are made stronger by their very strength and which gives us the strength to respond to them. For Chrétien, Jacob's wrestling with the angel is emblematic of this dynamic. And I had a great slide of the uh, painting by uh, David. Um, uh, no, by De, uh, no, by David. Um, uh, for, uh, in being defeated and rendered lame, Jacob is blessed and given a new, greater name. As Chrétien puts it in the chapter on offering the world to God in human speech, quote, praise that responds to the divine gift is the essence of human speech. That's the ultimate response. Um, Claudel gives voice, so Paul Claudel, the poet, gives voice to this dynamic throughout his career in his poetry, drama, and prose. So the lines I'm about to read from the fifth of the, sanc of the five great odes confirm the phenomenological descriptions of Chrétien and the line lengths and rhythms along with their repetitive parallel structure so recognizably Claudelian enforce a respiration pattern on the reader that dramatizes what they describe. So it's just two verses, uh, so I'll read it in French first so you can somewhat hear the, what I'm trying to say is this respiration pattern, then I'll read the translation. Le verbe de Dieu est celui en qui Dieu s'est fait à l'homme donnable. La parole créée est cela en qui toutes choses créées sont faites à l'homme donnable. The work of God is the one in whom God made himself givable to man. The created word is that in which all created things are made givable to man. In the third ode, Claudel directly asks God to allow him to gather the created things into his poetic speech so that through that human speech, the mute creatures may give their praise to God. So here I'll read the uh, translation. Uh, it's just four lines. Let me see and hear, so he's speaking to God, let me see and hear all things with the word and hail each one by its name, even with the word that made it. You see this earth, which is your innocent creature. Through my mouth, deliver it of this praise that it owes to you. So, in this way of thinking, the mute things around us, the creatures, um, are all dependent on us to, to, to speak for them. They, they, they make a call on us to speak for them. And, and their call is their beauty. There's this, um, there's this kind of pun in, in Greek, uh, and it, and it's, it exists in English too, but that um, uh, the word for beauty and for call is very similar, kalos, kalai. And in English, you have appeal, the word appeal. You know, so an appeal is a, is a call, but it's also the appeal, the attraction. Um, here, Venard's work might encourage us to ask how the poet conceives of the phonetic and semantic community between God and man. So it's, something he talks about over and over, the phonetic and semantic community between God and man. What is it exactly? Um, what is at stake in Claudel's request that he be allowed by God to um, 
Hail each one by its name, even with the word that made it. For Thomas, says Benab, the foundation of a durable human divine community depends on the relation that exists between nature and Holy Scripture. When a robust understanding of nature as created is in place, some version of the two books understanding, so the, the book of nature, the book of Scripture, book of creation, book of Scripture, um, some version of that understanding of reality shows itself to be operative. And thus the idea that the intelligence is illuminated by God, such that the mind speaking a word is understood as a constitutive element of the reality of the relation between God and his creation, becomes fitting. Benar writes, thus we discover with astonishment, and not with postmodern disillusionment, something of sacramentality, a transcendent spiritual reality giving itself in and through a sensible reality, already present in the very function of language. It's kind of a version of that definition of poetry that you read from Mark 10, but in language itself. That the source of language is functional sacramentality is Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, is nicely formally formulated by Ben Arlott in a sentence expressing the theology of human speech that accompanies the explicit theology of the word of the fourth gospel. He says, when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he also says, I am the signifier, the signified, and the referent. Odell recognizes that it is precisely this unique imbrication of the incarnate word and human language that makes the poet's offering of the word to God in a kind of arc of speech impossibly possible. A passage from Odell's famous play, The Satin Slipper, uh, 11 hours long on the stage, if you're interested, from the profession of faith spoken by the uh, vice king of Naples, puts it well. He, he says at a certain point, Will all beauty be useless? Come from God, is it not made in order to return to him? The poet and the painter are necessary to offer it to God, to reunite one word with the other word, and for it all to give thanks and recognition and prayer outside of time. So here Claudel's uh, vice king of Naples calls upon the artist to use speech in the awareness of what Venard calls the sacramental nature of its very function, which gives a spiritual reality in and through a sensual reality thus giving to all a glimpse of how the, quote, real is figure, as Bernard puts it. Modern French Catholic poetry in the line of Claudel helps us to see and understand that the communion between our language and the real, as revealed in faith, the phonetic and semantic community between God and man, the basis for an arc of speech, is brought to human awareness and acknowledgement poetically. So we have some time now to sort of, uh, as Stephen was saying, continue thinking about the connections between these three papers that have touched on time, poetics, and language. Uh, so I'll open the floor to all of you, and so we can start doing some of that work together. And I'll bring a microphone um, to people who are Great. Uh, you refer oh, I, to I think you might as use the sacramental, <laughs> Mr. Domestico. Now let me ask you, Anne. You, but you may distinguish. You distinguish between the Protestant and the Catholic approach. Do I understand that they are both equally sacramental, or is the Catholic uh, poet, poet poem more sacramental because it is more explicit, or, and the Protestant one is symbolic? Is that how you understand the distinction? So that's how Mason Clare understands the distinction. So in that, in that bit, it would have been, again, sorry to keep apologizing, it would have been a bit clearer if, if I had the, the a slide there. But that was a quote from Mason Clare, who's, as I mentioned, a really interesting figure. She's a novelist, critic. She's actually the first person to ever use the phrase stream of consciousness to describe what happens in literature. Um, but she's writing in The Egoist in 1914. And essentially what she's saying is, uh, Victorian poetry, and really non-modernist poetry, is Protestant in that it, its meaning depends upon referring to something other than itself, right? And so she says it's merely symbolic in that it gets its meaning from something other than itself. Mm -hmm. And she says the modernists, the imagists, are Catholic because their language contains, kind of incarnates, makes present whatever meaning it, it might have. And so for her, I, again, in her argument, 
modernists are Catholic because their poetry is kind of sacramentally efficacious, because it actually makes present its meaning in the, the material of the language itself. Whereas the Victorians are, she would say, Protestant because it's kind of empty symbology. That's a very sweeping statement about okay. that woman. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. That modernism is sacramental. I mean, it's fundamentally sacramental. I, I mean, I'm sure there are many modernist poets who certainly would argue with that point. It's a very sweeping statement. Yeah, but what's most striking to me is how many modernists actually agreed with that kind of sweeping claim. Well, um, Shall we count? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Another to the Mr. Uh, Lewis. Her? Yes. When you were, you refer to human speech as a response, do I understand what you meant by that? That human human speech is a response to divinity. Well, it's a response to divinity, but to anything in reality. So, um, Kafkian's fundamental insight is that we, whenever we speak, whenever we use language, we are always doing it in response to something that is in a sense, provoking it in us. Okay. And, and he also works this out in such a way that he can talk about um, even um, uh, manual responses and um, painting also. Like they all are modeled for him on speech. Which is ultimately a response to divinity, no? Yeah, that's right. So, well, so, so, but of course, you know, in phenomenology, you're not making, you're not always making statements about, um, or usually bracketing, uh, like an ultimate question like that. You're just looking at the phenomena. So, but yeah, certainly. I mean, he talks about um, speech acts of prayer. He talk, but but that can, that can be um, praise to to God, understood in faith. It could be praise, um, in you know, in a in a poem, of praise to. Uh, you know, like a, like a juju uh, music song in, in uh, Nigeria to one of the chiefs, you know, it's a kind of popular. But I mean, these are all, it's, it's praise. Therefore, phenomenology is implicitly Christian. Do I understand no, that? No, not necessarily. No, um, that's right, my point. Yeah. Yes. Right, and that's, and that's why I think actually talking about like a, a Thomist and a phenomenologist, uh -huh. both zeroed in on this um, in some ways the same thing you get this depth of account a, a deeper account of it because the the Thomas is going to go to uh, metaphysical depths with it that the, the phenomenological method is not the phenomenology is convincing not because of metaphysical arguments but because the description matches with experience the bet it, it completely uh, rises or falls, stands or falls on the, the quality of the description of the phenomenon. Okay. So. Thank you. Other questions? So you talked about how um, a lot of the modernists had a lot of theological Grappling, like for example, in the Criterion, there was all of this um, debate about neoscholasticism, and there was this idea that uh, the modernists were more um, Catholic, whereas the Victorians were more Protestant in a certain sense. I'm wondering, it just kind of seems like in the wake of modernism, um, everyone has what's been latched onto about modernism has been more the fragmentation and the disillusion and all of that. Um, can any of you sort of speak to why you think that happened and why, um, in a lot of ways, has modernism given rise to a lot of just extreme formlessness and things like that? And feel free to correct the wording of my question or my assumptions or my understanding, but I just kind of wondering about that. I mean, so what's interesting about Peggy is Whatever essay I'm reading, he's going to pick a fight. Um, and so for him to speak of modernity and fragmentation as if they come from 
something other than the Catholic Church is to misunderstand what has happened with modernity. Or for him, the Catholic Church assists in, in taking place. And it's, he's a socialist, so it's blended with a critique of capitalism and a concern that it's kind of an early version of subsidiarity, a, a concern that the, the means of making one's life are someone else's. And so for him, one of the things the Catholic Church has done is, is protect itself in a politique, which, which always destroys a mystique. And, um, and so I think he encourages us to, and these, uh, these other presentations actually have done this too, but the, he encourages us to stop thinking of modernity as, as purely other than Catholicism. Yeah, and I guess I, I would say that you know, I started off my talk by gesturing towards the, the canonical understandings of modernism's relationship to religion. And I'd say for a long time, this, you know, thinking about someone like Eliot, the general critical consensus was he experienced deep fragmentation and fracturing in the historical and political world around him. He experienced that fracturing and fragmentation psychologically, and that religion was a way for him out of that fragmentation or fracturing into a more coherent, kind of cohesive worldview. And I, I, I personally think that's a that's a misreading of Eliot. I think that Eliot um, and and other modernists modernists in general find theology imaginatively and spiritually nourishing, in part because it gives an account of why we feel fragmented and fractured and broken. Um, and so one of the figures who is actually most frequently talked about in the Criterion, it's quite remarkable when you dig into the book review section of the Criterion, how often uh, Karl Barth is mentioned as a theologian uh, that people are wrestling with at the time. And in all of the reviews, what, and I, and I think in, in Eliot's own response to Barth, um, we can see that he admires people like Bart, not because they see religious belief or theology as a way out of um, the experience of fragmentation and fracturing, but as a way of thinking in and through fracturing and fragmentation. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great question. Yeah, I'll just add one one other thing. So in in the French context, where you have, you know, uh, it's different from say in American modernism, where you don't have like a centuries-old church to rebel against. Um, it, it's very clear that, um, like in the work of Malade or even the Hanbo in, in certain instances, that what they are, and Vidal says it, this, that what they're modeling themselves on is like a poet as priest, but against Christianity because that's not the God, that's not the religion. And so they're trying to make, that's not the truth. So they're trying to, and I, I think you get some of this in pounds too, but it's not in a Catholic um, mode. But they're trying to. I mean, pound is a very religious poet in the early in the, in the cantos, and he's he's bringing together all these fragments and from all these cultures and trying to make make something um, I think religious. And Madame, you know. It explicitly talks about the, the priest confecting the Eucharist and how the poet is the real priest. And it's a book that you have to make, not, not the Eucharist. And so the question then becomes like, can you do, can you do that? Can you make your, uh, like going back to what some of what she was talking about with Piggy, can you make, can you construct the ultimate, the absolute, through poetry? And you know, Vidal says, no, it was a failure. Claudel doesn't ever try to do that. He, I mean, he has a whole, a whole poem called um, uh, La Messe la Bas, it's about, about the Mass, the different parts of the Mass. He never puts himself in the, in the role of the priest. So uh, I think that's just an additional thing to, to take note of. 
Thank you. And just because I can't uh, help but talk a little bit more about David Jones, there's a great uh, moment at the end of his essay, Art and Sacrament, where he quotes from uh, a French theologian, uh, theologian uh, Maurice de la Taille, and talks about what happens in Christ's crucifixion. And he says, uh, he placed himself, he meaning Christ, he placed himself in the order of signs. And so that resonates with the, the theology of language that you've been talking about. It's also a really interesting kind of counter to the more traditional modernist argument where, what did you say, the, the poet is the real priest? Mm -hmm. right? And that's obviously what Joyce is arguing. Yeah, right, that was a family. perfect example. Yeah, um, but there's actually something quite different happening in someone like Jones where he's saying something like, because of Christ's entrance into the world of sign making, sign making itself becomes a religious or Christic act, something like that. Um, yeah. I don't know if it's more Thomas than yeah. it sounds like Thomas. Yeah. yeah. So this is a question uh, for all three of you to, to tackle. There's a word that we've been throwing around a lot uh, today, yesterday, and it's, we're gonna hear a lot more. But I'm particularly curious from this group right here in front of us, uh, and in this subject about modernity and so on, how we define this word. The word is imagination. So what is the imagination? And maybe a, a helpful way to sort of like concretize that would be to filter maybe through Christian and Benar, through Piggy, and through you know, Sinclair or any of the Yes, the, yes that, that is what I meant particularly to ask. Yeah, so Piggy's going to pick a fight again. <laughs> um, he, he really loves, even when he's an atheist, he really loves Pascal. And Pascal hates the imagination. <laughs> Because it's lies, <laughs> it's not in front of you. Uh, and if you get lost in it, you'll forget about the real. And uh, in Peggy's context, he's concerned that people won't address the desperately poor in front of them because they're, they're daydreaming about a future that's not yet or a past that is no longer. Oh, remember the monarchy? Like, Whatever, Pinky doesn't care. He, he wants uh, the present most addressed. But the, since he is a poet, he, he is a fan of symbolic thinking. And I, and I think he thinks revolutions recover those kinds of things. And in recovering them, make, make them more daring. Because the revolution he says it stands in hope to introduce the genuinely new. Uh, so that's probably the closest he gets to our colloquial use of imagination. Um, that's a, a great and really difficult question. Um, Why ask it? Yeah. So, so I would I would recommend that the uh, actually have a copy with me look at it, uh, the Maritain essay on poetry and religion from the Criterion, because there I think he's using poetry roughly synonymously with imagination. And, and what he'd say uh, is, I think, something like um, the imagination is the, um, the creation of symbols so as to apprehend the real. Right? So it's not that the imagination, to, to go back to your, your, it's not the imagination and the real are uh, antithetical to one another, we encounter the real through the imagination. Yeah, so, um, um, yeah, what, like, thinking about Piggy, so um, one word that that is a great word with him is even, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And, yeah. and so, like, she was talking about, um, uh, well, Christianity versus Christianism. So Christianism is a lot of, of the, the neg it's the negative, um, neg the, the bad, bad thing that's done as if it were Christianity. And um, so Christianity is rooted always in response to it, 
an event, ultimately the event of Christ. And um, and so there's this, there's this. It, it can never be. Therefore, Christ is never my idea. He happens to be. He happens to, and, and so it even happens now in in the witnesses of, of the body of Christ. And um, and so when when you start to use your imagination, which I, I don't know, I often think imagination is even just thought. <laughs> but so when you start to think in relation to an event, as opposed to what I can invent, uh, the con- what I can construct as my reality versus what's really there, then it's like like what Fanny House said this morning about attention. Or poetry is attention. Um, and then, you know, within that intent, attention, uh, like some of the Thomistic language about, uh, you know, analogy or figure and and um, reality, um, just, I mean, taking the Eucharist, you know, the accident and the, and the substance. I mean, or if you think about Dante, you know, like, what is what is real and what is figure in any, any uh, episode in Dante? It's like, it really starts to blow your mind if you think about that. So, um, yeah, it's like, it's an alternative to a kind of more vague and, a, uh, I guess, we would make say romantic. I don't, I don't want to give the romantics a bad name because they have some really interesting stuff to say about imagination. But what's often thought of as romantic imagination, I think, is not what we're talking about right here. It's, it's this um, attention to the real and constant uh, uh, like awareness and, in some way, struggling with our human tendency to to invent instead of. I think, just to go with that for a second, there's a, I think there's a way in Peggy's eventing, it's like a, it's like a verbal noun. Jared? Sorry. Um, <laughs> he, Presents a Christianity whose first concern is where is Christ now and not how do I protect my place in the world? Because our place is for the world. And I think uh, that really opens up what Catholic imagination might be. Instead of a kind of nostalgia for the things we have made, it's a tool for problem solving. We have time for about one more question right at the back again. Yeah, so that last response sort of ties into my question. Uh, I was really struck by uh, the mention of Barton's essay in Criterion. Um, and I was just thinking, um, moving from an aesthetic to a political dimension, just how integral he is to the post war political order. And I'm wondering, because I often hear a rhetorical move made by. <clears throat> Catholics and Christians more broadly to say that, well, modernism and Christianity and Catholicism are really intimately linked, um, either aesthetically or politically. So, sort of like, oh, hey, secularists, this political order we all enjoy is, in fact, deeply Christian. But then I just wonder how, uh, sort of, what motivates that move? Is it just a nostalgia or kind of a, like, oh, you didn't know this, but now you do? Or is that constructive to develop a response that Catholicism can have to modernity? Um, that is sort of more productive and less less about the past, more about the present and the future. And I guess that's directed to all three presenters. Or any of the yeah, any of, yeah, so, those specific thinkers have, yeah. like, I imagine that he Yeah, he, um, so there's sort of two things going on at once. Uh, the church has produce modernity, but what that does is end the world. Um, and and so the Christian actually has to deal with both things. What's, what is Christianity, but also how have we lost the world? Which which allows him to, to in a complicated way, make sense of things like atheism as genuinely its own thing and a historical response to the Catholic Church. So the world can run on the exhausted fumes of the Catholic world. Um, the, the real question is, how do I nourish the world? 
And so Peggy completely reorients the question, not how do I have a good answer, but how do I, how do I nourish time itself? Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, all three of you, for a wonderful presentation. Please join me in thanking you.